Section 1. You will hear a woman asking about membership of a society. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi. I'd like some information about joining the International Arts Society. That's no problem. What exactly can I help you with? First of all, I'd like to know about the membership fee. Well, there are two types of membership. Can you tell me what they are? First, there is lifetime membership, which means that you can have access to all the facilities at the Society itself and all exhibitions. Plus, you can have discounts to various events at affiliated arts organisations here and abroad. And on top of that, you can use the lifetime members' room. How much is that type of membership? Well, the lifetime membership fee is £1,537. Hmm. OK. It's rather a lot to pay in one go. Uh, what about the other membership? The ordinary membership, that's £193 per year. That sounds a bit more reasonable. Um, what does that entitle you to? You can visit the Society, including the exhibitions, the library and follow the arts programmes on weekdays during the opening times from 10am to 9pm and at the weekend between 10am and 5pm. On Saturday, if there's a special event like a lecture or restricted showing of an exhibition, then it opens until 9pm. So, what is the difference between this and the lifetime membership. In the long run, you save money as you're making a one-off payment and you have exclusive use of the lifetime members' room. OK. What arts programmes do you run? Well, the Society has a very extensive programme to cater for all tastes. There's a series of exhibition rooms for the permanent collection of paintings, watercolours and sculpture. And then there's a new exhibition area which opened at the beginning of the year. And we run a series of courses and lectures to go with the exhibitions. Can I ask about the lectures? What is scheduled for this year? The latest list is in this leaflet. Oh, yes. That looks very good. Are all the exhibitions, etc., free if I join? Yes, everything is free. That's fair enough. I think in that case I'll join. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I just need to take your name, address and telephone number. First, your name. Margaret Rochester. I take it that's R-O-C-H-E-S-T-E-R? -E -E yes, that's it. And the address? It's 55 Stone Avenue. OK. Avenue. And the postcode? Mm, let's see. It's MA74PQ. And a daytime telephone number? Can I give you my work number? Yeah, that's fine. It's 0207 895 
6620, and the extension is 6633. Can I pay by credit card? Yes, of course. Do you want to pay for the full year at one time or by monthly instalments? You pay £4 extra a month if you pay by instalments. OK. I think I'll pay by monthly instalments. Right. If you just complete this form, then we can set up the monthly payments. OK. If you just put your PIN number in the machine, I can deduct the first month's payment. Right. That's gone through. Here's your card. I now just need to take your photograph over here and then I can put it on your membership card. OK. That's it. I'll just print out your membership card. Right. Here you are. Thank you. By the way, can I bring any friends to the Society exhibitions and lectures? With the ordinary membership, we can issue a day pass once a fortnight, which allows you to bring a friend in. But you have to accompany them. Thank you. Can I go in now? Yes. You just swipe your card here. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a speech to a group of volunteers preparing for a town's anniversary celebrations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now for the preparation plans for the town's 250th anniversary celebrations. We are going to follow the same system we had last year, but with a few changes to increase the party spirit. First of all, this time we are going to make the concert on the beach open to everyone without charge. This is because we have been given money by the council for the celebration and also because last year we had so many problems with keeping people out who had not paid. And on top of this, people will not have to pay for refreshments either as these are being donated. Right now, hmm, we are going to divide into four teams. The first one, the beach team, will be responsible for cleaning up the beach on the Saturday morning, picking up litter, bottles, plastic bags, wood and anything else that's lying around. Everyone is meeting at the beach shop at 8am. It's an early start, but we want to give everywhere a good thorough clean. We have had permission from the council to close the beach to get it ready for the anniversary celebration on Sunday. The second team will be responsible for setting out seating in the square for the speeches and prize giving. Again, an early start is preferable, but the vans with the seats can't be there until 9am, so shall we say that everyone should meet at the village hall at 9.30? Starting then will allow extra time if the vans are late. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, the third team will be the judges. For each of the various competitions, we will have three judges. On the whole, they will have had experience of judging before. There will be a boat race, a swimming competition and the best fancy dress. A cash prize will be given to the winner in each category and for the two runners-up, there will be book tokens. There is a sponsored mini-marathon and by the deadline, lunchtime today, we had 263 applicants with ages ranging from 15 to 60. That's 80 more than last year. Each entrant has paid a £20 registration fee to enter and all the profits will go to the local children's hospital to help fund much-needed specialist apparatus. The fourth team consists of the wardens for the day itself. We are expecting at least 10,000 people, if last year is anything to go by. The fields near the entrance to the beach can be used as car parks, and we need wardens to help make sure the actual parking is more organised than last year, which was a mess. We also need someone to be in charge of the first aid, which will be at the entrance to the beach. Finally, we need some volunteers for the clean-up. Last year we didn't do this very well, and so the council has agreed to provide large bags to collect all the recyclable material, like glass and plastic, etc. But we have to deal with the rest, like leftover food, ourselves. We don't want to leave piles of rotten food around or dangerous bottles. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah. I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly. But what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did? The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time. And I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite, I'm afraid. I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess. Mm, that's OK, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple-choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple-choice questions benefit men more than women. 
They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure that I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discuss the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen Organise your thoughts and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the marks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this, 
the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole. Covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres, the ocean constitutes approximately one-seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20% of the world's total ocean area. At the equator, it is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the Southern Ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, Islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship, that we have stationed off Antarctica in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day 
with researchers working in shifts, and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection, which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.